Hi, it's Ryan. So I just recorded this whole video and wrote it out and then it corrupted, the file corrupted in my iPad. So I'm going to do this lecture just slightly differently so I don't have to rewrite it again. Uh, so this is where we left off in class. We were discussing the beginning states of any star and we got to the point that we labeled as step five where we have a proto star that is nearly complete completely uh, or completed its collapse uh, and the Coulomb barrier was broken. In doing so it starts uh, a nuclear reactive process called the proton-proton chain and then I created a whole video describing the proton-proton chain so we're gonna go through that now. The proton-proton chain, I've kind of created uh, two different views of it, sort of a chemistry view where we're looking at the chemical processes that are going on inside the core of our protostar. And then I drew a diagrammatic representation of these equations. Now something to keep in mind is that this proton-proton chain, which is also known as hydrogen fusion, is the energy source of our star. And I've simplified it in this lecture. Really, this is approximately one third of the chemical reactions that are going on in order to, for the star to undergo this hydrogen fusion. But uh, this makes the most sense for our class. So chemically speaking, we have two common hydrogen being smashed together by gravitational forces. In other words, the Coulomb barrier gets broken and the repulsive electric force that is keeping those two positive hydrogen nuclei apart is overcome by the deep, heavy gravitational force in the core of this protostar. When they get smashed together, they create a new element. It's sort of a similar element. It's called heavy hydrogen or deuterium. And then they create byproducts, a positron, which is the antimatter constituent of an electron, and then something called a neutrino, namely an electron neutrino. Neutrinos come in three flavors. We think they have masses, but we're not exactly sure what those masses are. We know that they're so small that neutrinos pass through virtually everything they come across. They originate it in the cores of stars and maybe some other places. And we have thousands of neutrinos passing through us or the Earth uh, any given second of the day. So, in other words, we take two hydrogen, smash them together to get a deuterium, and a little bit of antimatter and neutrino. While this is going on, some of those deuterium atoms can be, or I guess deuterium nuclei, can be smashed together with more hydrogen nuclei to create what we call light helium and a little extra energy in the form of a gamma ray. Once we have enough of these light helium particles, gravitational force can force them together and we will get common helium along with some more common hydrogen and a little extra energy to go. And so we call this hydrogen fusion because in the core of this protostar we're fusing hydrogen to create helium and some energy. I did a diagrammatic representation of this chemical reaction where I showed three cute little hydrogens being smashed together by the forces due to gravity with some pew 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 little lines showing that energy that's going to come from that. And the outcome, of course, would be this helium nucleus, a whole bunch of extra energy in the form of light, namely gamma rays, the most energetic wavelength of light, some positrons, and some electron neutrinos. Now keep in mind, this reaction will be occurring um, quite frequently because we have the 10 to the 54 original particles all trying to be smashed together. 
And you might note to yourself that the net result of the proton-proton chain, also known as hydrogen fusion, is the conversion of hydrogen into helium via a nuclear process. And that nuclear process has been sort of depicted for you both chemically and diagrammatically. So this again is a, a very simplified version of the hydrogen fusion that, under, that is going on in the core of our protostar. This is what is giving it uh, all of that uh, very energetic ener uh, light and thermal energy in its core. And then I've written out some details for you. So if you look at a periodic table, you'll see that the relative mass of hydrogen is 1.008, and that is an atomic mass unit, but we're just not going to put the units on there. That's the mass of one hydrogen, and I know it's hard to write numbers without their units, but we're going to let it slide this time. Well, in this reaction, we have four of these common hydrogen nuclei being smashed together. Keep in mind, I keep saying nuclei and not atoms, because in the core of this protostar, it's so... Uh, they're so energetic that they've shed their electrons, and so they're not atoms anymore. They're ions, I guess, but they're also uh, in a different phase of matter we like to call plasma. Point is, if we take four of these hydrogen nuclei and smash them together, the mass should be four times the mass of one hydrogen nuclei, right? Or nucleus. When we multiply this by four, we get this number keeping in mind that the byproduct of this reaction is helium, we could look at back at the periodic table to see that the relative mass of helium is 4.003 atomic mass units. And that means we're missing some mass between this interaction and the byproduct, which is helium. If you take the difference in these two numbers, you get 0.029. And I can tell you that the general mass of the positrons and neutrinos that are produced in this reaction are approximately 0 0.003, and so we're still missing mass. In fact, we're missing 0 0.026 atomic mass units worth of mass. And so I might ask you, where does the mass go? And the answer came uh, way back around 1905 from one of our favorite physicists, I like to call him Uncle Al, Albert Einstein, he came up with a relationship that showed an inex uh, inextricable, uh, I guess it's an inextricable relationship between energy and mass. What is it? What is Einstein's famous equation? I bet you thought in your mind E equals mc squared. Turns out uh, oh, by the way, the relative mass of 1.008 is approximately 1.70 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. So we're talking about very small amounts of mass here. Small or not, we're still missing some. The missing mass, of course, is turned into pure energy through these nuclear processes, and it's described by Uncle L, E equals mc squared. But then I decided to say, no, that's not actually true. The equation he came out with, which is relativistic energy, is, no, is written E squared equals its momentum squared times the speed of light squared plus m squared c to the fourth. And if, of course, something isn't moving, this equation simplifies into the famous E equals mc squared. It's so important because what this equality tells us is that energy and mass are unequivocally related, and so they can you can sort of change between mass and energy in our universe. Now, we can't just do it on our own. It takes a lot of uh, external energy to enable some sort of nuclear response like this or nuclear process like this, but the point is energy and mass are interchangeable in nature, so this missing mass isn't really missing, it just was converted or turned into gamma rays, mostly. Okay, so 
keeping in mind that we were continuing our discussion on what was labeled as step six in our stellar evolution notes, I just want to kind of conclude the step six now that we have the proton-proton chain going on. When critical temperatures and pressures are achieved in the core of the protostar, then hydrogen fusion via the proton-proton chain begins and a star is born. So after step five, we finally have a baby star. Well, actually, it turns out that this is now a middle-aged star, but we'll see that in a moment. I would noted in here that a protostar is a strong IR source, and it's often referred to as an embryonic star. So the last step in this little video is step six. Step six. Step six is all about uh, the star finally coming to its own. So the star finishes contracting and becomes stable. At this point, the star is considered to be middle-aged and it will spend 90% of its life this way. So it took approximately 5% of its total life to get here, and now it's going to spend 90% of its life looking exactly as it does. We break stars into three categories when we're discussing stellar evolution. The first category is low mass stars, which I've chosen a, a weight or a mass um, range for our class that's slightly different than the accepted mass range. I like to keep our class a little unique. The size, the numbers here can be changed. It doesn't really affect your knowledge of what this means. Point is, we break stars into three subcategories based on how much mass they have. We describe the mass of a star with respect to solar masses, where one solar mass is the mass of our sun, the symbol we use for a solar mass is a capital M with this cute little dot circle next to it. And this, the um, solar mass is always equal to 1.99 times 10 to the 30 kilograms, which is, oh, about a, a million times more mass than the Earth has. Anyway, a low mass star is categorized for being anywhere from 0 0.08 times the size of our sun, in other words, approximately 8% the size of our sun, all the way up to five times the size of our sun. Medium mass stars pick up from there. They go from five solar masses to 20 solar masses. And anything greater than 20 solar masses, we will classify as a high mass star. We, just, we give you these categories because the mass classification of a star dictates usually the lifespan of that star, the, oftentimes the color of that star, and how that star will go about living and dying. So the mass of a star tells us quite a lot. Well, that's it for these notes. Sorry they were a little different than uh, normal, but hopefully this one will work out.